My name is Felicitas Katepa Mupandwa. I am with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here in Saskatoon. I'm the Director of Research, Development and Technology for uh, the centers in Saskatchewan. So, uh, our first speaker this afternoon is Mark Tester. Mark is Professor of Biosciences at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And he was previously in Adelaide, where he was a research professor in the Australian Center for Plant Functional Genomics and director of the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility. He now leads a research group in which forward and reverse genetic approaches are used to understand and manipulate traits that contribute to salinity, tolerance, and improve this in crops such as barley and tomatoes. His aspiration, it says here, is to unlock seawater by developing a new economically viable agricultural system where so tolerant crops are irrigated with partially desalinized seawater or brackish groundwater. So I'm happy to introduce Mark Tester, who will give a presentation on salt tolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, so salinity is a pretty widespread issue globally, and uh, in particular, it's uh, very uh, dominant in the in the Middle East and North Africa, West Asia, uh, and I'm right in the centre of that particular area of affected ground. So classically, we, I've been uh, thinking about the effects of salinity on dryland agriculture, where I did the last decade of my research. Um, in southern Australia, where subsoil salinity was affecting the Australian wheat belt. And, uh, however, when I moved to the Middle East and started to appreciate much more the importance of irrigation in agriculture um, and the importance of salinity in irrigated systems, I really started to focus much more on irrigated systems. So although only about 17% of cropping land is, is um, is, 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 is irrigated, it's been estimated that approximately 40% of the, of the world's food is actually produced under irrigation. So it's an extremely important um, a, a contribution to world food production. And the problem is that a large fraction of this, I mean, it's estimated 25%. These numbers, you know, who knows? But these, are, these numbers are possibly somewhat wobbly, but uh, there is definitely uh, an, an, an empirically observed fact that groundwater reserves are being depleted and this is primarily due to abstraction for agriculture and this has been observed here by a, a pair of NASA satellites that have been circulating the planet for over a decade now and this has been ground truthed as well and most of the major w world um, uh, underground water stores are being depleted because of agriculture and concomitant with this depletion in groundwater is a decrease in the quality of that water. Um, and we can also talk about um, uh, seawater ingress and the, 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 the very highly productive areas such as the mouth of the Brahmaputra and the mouth of the Mekong in Vietnam are also very highly affected by salinity. Okay, in Saudi Arabia, you see it a lot, where um, oases after oases are being abandoned and it really is happening in a very widespread way. So this is just one example. I was on the way to um, a place called Wabar Crater, where I've actually been with Susan, uh, but I just stopped for a picnic and it just happened across this oasis, which has been completely abandoned and it was definitely due to salinity and been there for hundreds of years because just right next to the abandoned oasis was this ancient old village, which has uh, relatively recently been abandoned. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. You think about um, uh, uh, irrigation and, um, and salinity and dryland salinity. That's what you put in your grant applications. So that's what I was doing in my grant applications for quite a while. Uh, but then coming to cows, there's also another whole opportunity for making an impact with salinity tolerant crops. Um, and that's by trying to develop a whole new agricultural system, which you mentioned 
in, in the introduction. So we have a little bit of the world's water is usable, but there are massive amounts of the world's water which is either saline in the oceans, about 96% of the water is in the oceans, and then there's also a very significant fraction of the uh, surface and groundwater which is brackish or um, salty, so often just not towards as salty as, as, as the oceans. And um, it would be great if we were able to access, to unlock some of that huge water resource which is uh, too salty for current use. And so the aspiration is to try to irrigate salt-tolerant crops with partially desalinized seawater. Full desalination is, is just thermodynamically, energetically very, very um, expensive, costs a dollar per cubic meter. Yes, that might go down with more efficiencies and so on, but you can have massive decrease in the cost per cubic meter if you don't fully desalinize, but if you partially desalinize. If, for example, if by using a technology of forward osmosis, which I'll explain later if anybody wants, but that's a low energy, close to zero energy form of partial desalination. So the, the, the dream is that you decrease the cost of the um, partially desalinized water that you're going to use for irrigation and you increase the salinity tolerance of the crops and you meet in an economically viable middle ground and that would unlock a whole new area of land and water for agriculture. That's the system I want to develop. And I'm very serious about this. So it is an aspiration. You might laugh at it, but I'm going to give it a go. All right. Of course, if you're going to go around irrigating with brackish water, you have to manage the saline drainage. This is a very big issue. It's not new technology. It requires management. It requires systems, both at the level of the farm and at the level of the aquifer for management. But again, this is not impossible, and it isn't even that technologically difficult. So um, the sums are more likely to work out first in horticultural systems, which is why I've moved over to opening a research program on tomatoes in particular, then in the future the sums might come to work out for broad acre crops. I want to both increase the tolerance of domesticated species, and we're focusing on two crops which are already tolerant, so let's make something good better, then we're more likely again to have the sums work out. And those two crops are tomatoes and barley. And I should point out that Saudi Arabia is the world's biggest importer of barley by a factor of two, China being the second biggest importer. Massive, 8 million tonnes imported into um, Saudi Arabia last year. Um, so we increase the tolerance of domesticated species and then domesticate highly tolerant species. So salicornia is one extreme example, but I think another example which I think could be put in this category is quinoa, an old crop which has been really only partially domesticated and requires a lot more domestication and is very highly salt tolerant. Okay, so this is the sort of field that we see in Saudi Arabia. This is slides I just added in this morning for this talk in the light of people asking me questions in the pub last night. So this is a field which is abandoned um, on a field station near Jeddah. Uh, and we had to repair the centre pivot and fix its broken axle and flat tyres and all of that and uh, pump and, and, and open up the bore again. And this had been abandoned because the water was too saline. It actually wasn't that saline. It was five, seven, about seven decisiemens. So about one quarter, one third, one quarter seawater. Uh, and uh, then these are two guys, the quinoa um, researchers from BYU, Jeff Morn and Rick Yellen, who, with whom I'm collaborating. And we stuck this field under quinoa and actually got five tonnes per hectare um, yield. So this is the way it was looking. It just grew really, really well. So there are lots of op opportunities really to develop salt tolerant crops. And if we can domesticate this crop, stop it from falling over and doing all, it's all branchy. It's a mad crop. We want to be able to commodify this. Uh, I think we've got a good chance of doing that. Another aspect, if we're going to go for tomatoes and go for covered systems, is uh, um, that, especially in hot climates, about 80% of the water that's used is, in fact, not for irrigating the plants, but for cooling the greenhouse. So it's complete lunacy. You, you spend all this energy desalinizing the water, then you run it over cardboard pads, because that's what the greenhouse company sells you, and evaporate it, and that's 80% that's, yeah, of your water consumption. It's completely mad. And you don't need to use cardboard pads. And, and in the desert environments, they get blocked up really quickly, even with desalin uh, properly um, RO um, purified water, uh, if only because of the dust. <laughs> it's a very dusty environment that uh, is in a lot of the world. Uh, and so we just had the idea of uh, we live in a volcanic region, lots of volcanic rocks. You can make a very coarse brick, and then you make um, like jet, um, jet uh, 
you know, the nozzles in a jet aircraft uh, that, that, that go down. So we shaped the bricks, uh, just built a mould, cost $50,000, built a mould, and then went down to the local concrete factory and just used their the thing. Instead of moulding bricks, we mould these things. We've got a company set up now. Commercial delivery is actually going on now. So at the ends of greenhouses, this is a real greenhouse on a real farm in Saudi Arabia. When they want to replace their cardboard pads that are blocked up, which they have to do almost every year, you try to convince them to not do that, but to build one of these cheap comp blocks walls. They cost maybe three times as much. They're not quite as efficient. The delta T is about one degree less efficient than with a cardboard pad, but it's not bad. And you're running seawater over these things. You can even run brine over these things. They're still effective. This one has been running for over two years. No build-up of um, blocking of salts or stuff. So it's a good system. That's the way they look at the end of the greenhouse. So that's one thing that we're trying to do as part of the package. But anyway, I'm a plant scientist, so we should back off onto, onto the plant science and onto my safer ground. Um, we're using a forward genetic approach, and I think forward genetics is, is really viable now in crops because we can turbocharge it with modern genomics, and we try to discover genes which are responsible for natural variation. Uh, what genes are in this crop which is making, in this variety, which is making this more salt tolerant than this variety, which is clearly more salt sensitive, and then can we use that knowledge to increase tolerance in sensitive varieties of plants. Now, salinity tolerance is complex, multigenic. You can't really do the genetics of salinity tolerance per se, so we take a step backwards and hypothesize that a series of different traits which we can we can phenotype in a pragmatic, high-throughput way, you know, on, on a scale that's tractable for genetic studies. Uh, if we can get a series of traits that we can, we can phenotype and look at the genetics of the traits that we hypothesize contribute to the salinity tolerance. And these are traits, the first three are traits that were summarized in a paper by Munns and um, Tester a few years ago in a review. And, uh, and, and then these are traits which I've been thinking about since I moved to Saudi Arabia and that we actually are now starting to study, and I'll show you some results on those later. Okay, so we don't study salinity tolerance per se, but the traits that we hypothesize contribute to the salinity tolerance. We're taking a forward genetic approach. Now, it's not a strictly forward genetic approach, um, but it's mainly forward genetics. And of course, when you get down to an interval, and depending on the link is disequilibrium and so on, you might have 50 candidate genes, then you start to cheat. And you go and look at the Arabidopsis literature, you look at the rice literature and so on, and see what candidates are most likely to be the ones conferring your trait. And then you grind away to characterize the gene and the alleles um, at that final step. But during that forward genetic phase, you can uh, narrow things down, yes, from 50,000 genes to 50 genes. It's not bad. And uh, you need to use traits that are easily quantified. We're studying natural variation, not de novo mutation. And the philosophy behind this is that if we're looking at a trait which is there already, then that trait is less likely to come with significant deleterious secondary effects because it's already been subjected to the rigours of either natural selection, if we're looking at wild relatives, or artificial selection, if we're looking at land races or even crops, um, crop varieties. So we're using natural variation for a very, very important reason. But, of course, to do this, you need to have diverse genetic resources. And this is just an example of some amazing resources sitting um, degrading gently and sadly in a, in a seed collection in Tehran. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we, 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 we're going to do these experiments either in the field or in control conditions, depending on the trait. We try to do things in the field, because then you're more likely to be able to have something that's going to deliver in the long run, but sometimes you can't. If you needed to manipulate the, the environmental conditions, for example, you might need to be in controlled conditions. Uh, and if you do that, you certainly then need to go out and test the significance of that trait ultimately when you're in, uh, in, in a range of field conditions. So sometimes you find things that you measure in controlled conditions that are relevant and sometimes they're not. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Okay, and the final little general point I want to make is that, yes, a lot of the abiotic stresses that we're going to hear about today are often complex, they are often multigenic, but that does not mean that one allele that affects one trait that contributes to the overall abiotic stress tolerance you're wanting, that does not mean that one of those traits cannot make a small contribution or even a large contribution towards the overall package of salinity tolerance. People always ask you, so, 
is your plant salt tolerant or not? You know, everybody wants things black and white, right or wrong, left or right. It's not like that. It's a quantitative thing, and a small contribution can make a contribution towards the total package. Okay, uh, genotyping, of course, is making all of, this, uh, all of this possible, so we can use genomic data in a range of crops. And hand in glove with that, phenotyping is now becoming increasingly sophisticated, and this is very important. So digital imaging, computer vision, robotics are all enabling us to do more and more quantitative phenotyping in more and more realistic conditions. I think this is a really exciting time for abiotic stress tolerance research in plant science. So I think, yes, the genetics of salinity tolerance traits is tractable and even in um, commercial crops. I've got cereals there, I should say commercial crops. I've already said my current focus is on barley and tomatoes, and that's partly because they're already tolerant, so that's therefore it's going to be better for the ultimate delivery and uh, this development of my new system I'm dreaming of. But also, <laughs> if you're working with a salt tolerant plant, then that means it's got genes or alleles of them that are more likely to be more interesting because they're actually in a salt tolerant plant. Personally, looking at salinity tolerance in Arabidopsis, or even rice, actually, even though I do it, <laughs> is really a little bit dumb because they're very, very salt sensitive. Um, the other reason we use those two crops is because they're diploid, inbred, there's good genome sequences, and they can be genetically transformed if you want to test the hypothesis of a particular allele conferring a particular trait. I'd just like to um, advertise that we're starting to work on quinoa, um, and we've, we've just sequenced the quinoa genome, and uh, we're uh, now doing quite a large association um, genetic study with quinoa in the field. Okay, um, this is one example using that philosophy that I just uh, tried to summarise. This is one example which was published a few years ago now uh, from work that was done both uh, with a student funded by the ACPFG and uh, in, by CSIRO. It was started about 15 years ago. People were talking about timelines. This was a 15-year project. Uh, where Rana Munns walked into my uh, lab in Cambridge and said, I've got two different varieties of wheat and they've got about a five-fold difference in sodium accumulation. Why? And so that started a really good collaboration with Rana and actually really helped me move to Australia. And we discovered the gene. It was a gene called HKT15. It's a sodium transporter that sucks sodium out of the transpiration stream as it's heading towards the shoot, so it's like a last-ditch firefighting effort by the plant to m make the concentration of sodium in the, in the shoot stay as low as possible for as long as possible. And uh, the hypothesis was that this would confer a yield increase in saline conditions in the field. And what we found was a very, very important result. So here are the field results with um, uh, near isogenic lines with and without the allele, uh, of the sodium-excluding allele. In fact, there was a complete absence of the gene in the, in the sodium-sensitive lines and the presence of the gene in the sodium-tolerant lines. And when you grow the plants in the low-salt part of the field, you don't get any yield penalty. So it's an extremely important point that's been already mentioned earlier. The breeders won't be interested in anything if it, doesn't have, if it has any yield penalty in what are otherwise reasonable conditions. This was about 3 tonnes per hectare, 3.5 tonnes per hectare in uh, northern New South Wales field. And then when you got uh, to a slightly saltier part of the field, there was no yield penalty still. And when you got to a saltier part of the field, there was still no yield penalty, so that's all fine. And then when you got to the very salty part of the field, there was a big headline-grabbing <laughs> increase in salinity tolerance, a really strong trait uh, leading to a really strong increase in salinity tolerance. It's a result I'm very proud of. And uh, you've got good science, we've got good impact, it's all fine. The problem <laughs> with this experiment is that by the time we got this 25% increase in yield, the yield in the lines that didn't have the gene was down at one tonne per hectare. So we'd already reduced the yield by about two thirds. The plants were on their knees, they looked awful. And so, wow, we can increase the yield from one to 1.25 tonnes per hectare. To be honest, I don't really call that a great result. <laughs> I don't think that we're going to feed the world with that type of result. And so that was a pity. So here we were. This was about 2.5 tonnes. This was 2 tonnes. Had to get down to 1 tonne before we got a benefit. So I, I, I thought, it's nice science. It's a nice story. But there's a real error in detail. But at least we found it because we were testing in the field and we were testing yield. So this type of result led to us having to sort of re-examine ourselves, go back to like our own review, you know, the Munns and Tess review, and say what other traits might actually make a contribution in those moderately saline affected fields, which are really the fields that are mostly grown by most farmers in most places. 
And um, so, yeah, we had to work out how to, how to both develop phenotypy for those other traits and then do some genetics on those traits. Now, in the meantime, I moved to Saudi Arabia. Actually, that was why I built the plant accelerator, so I could measure some of these traits, um, such as osmotic tolerance, uh, which was an inhibition of growth before there had been much sodium accumulated in the shoot. Uh, but then I moved to Saudi Arabia, and I started talking to other people, and this was very healthy, and I talked to a chap called Klaus Pillen, a Bali geneticist from Martin Luther University in Halle. We were destined to work with each other, Halle, salt. So, um, and he collected many years before, a few years before, um, uh, used germplasm that had been collected from around the Middle East, 25 different lines, and crossed them all to the same mother line, bark, to develop a nested association mapping population. And this was uh, taken through so to a stage where there are about 1,400 lines in 25 families. Each of these lines had about three quarters domesticated barley, barker, and about one quarter wild barley. And that's great. So you had about a quarter wild barley. You had a good chance of finding interesting new alleles and interesting variation. But there was still enough domesticated barley in there for the plants to generally behave themselves if you're in a field trial. And I was increasingly, with Peter's encouragement, I should acknowledge, increasingly going into field um, phenotyping. Uh, they've been, they've been um, um, genotyped with a 9K SNP array to get about 5,000 unique SNPs. That was fine. Uh, but they're actually now being genotyped using exome sequencing. So that should really increase the genetics. So this is just one example I'm going to give you. Um, I can give you more examples. I'm giving a seminar tomorrow in the University of Saskatchewan, actually, if you want to. Uh, well, I'll be giving a lot more examples there of some of our results. But at any rate, here's the field results I'll give for this population. We also did characterize them in the plant accelerator, but I'm just going to show you the field data because I'm quite proud of it. So this is the field experiment that we did. Um, uh, I must acknowledge at this stage the International Centre for Biosaline Agriculture in Dubai, who've been fantastic people to collaborate with, doing really good field trials. And we did everything with drip irrigation. It was about a hectare of drip irrigation lines. I must calculate how many kilometres of hosing we used. But at any rate, um, we had the field in two halves, a low salt part and a high salt part. We actually used two different mapping populations, a mapping, association mapping population from Wobby War, the data for which we just haven't even had chance to analyze yet. None of this talk, by the way, is published, so this is all unpublished data. And this is a nested association mapping population. It was all hand planted, uh, and yes, I calculated there were about a million plants hand planted and hand harvested in this experiment using a team of about 16 workers. And um, yeah, so we were able to do quantitative genetics in the field. And I think this is, this is yeah, it's a very, very interesting experiment. I'd like to um, acknowledge here that all the analyses, the genetic analyses, were done by Stephanie Sada, a, a, a very bright young Lebanese PhD student in my laboratory in Saudi Arabia. And Mohammed Shahid oversaw the, um, the, the team of 16 Pakistani workers um, in, in the field here. He's also a really good guy to work with. Okay, and um, just I'm going to show you one result, <laughs> but it's a, it's a result, it's a mother of results. Um, what we have here um, are the seven chromosomes arranged in this circos plot, and here each of these pairs of lines are referring to five, in this case, in this plot, five different traits, all right, heading time and um, harvest index and grain per ear and yield. And it's... The, 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 the boxes are paired at each locus uh, for uh, the, the effect of the, of the wild allele on, uh, in control conditions and in saline conditions. And what we were doing was a type of genetic analysis, mainly done by Stephanie and Andreas Maurer um, in University of Halle, in Klaus Pillen's laboratory. So they, they ran uh, 100 GWAS analyses that were cross-validated. And so what we have here is a line showing the size of the effects of the allele. And here is the number of times during the GWAS analyses that the, the, uh, a significant association was observed. And you can see that there's lots of these interesting looking loci, but almost all of them are associated with flowering time. And so, because we're in the field and it's in the desert, we've got interactions with, with heat. 
Uh, and also, it's very noticeable that a lot of these interactions, these triangles around here, by the way, are showing the, um, the effect of the, of the uh, exotic allele. So a blue down arrow means that the allele from the for wild plants were, was negative. Uh, it's of academic interest, a lot of these results, but I want to try to make plants more salt tolerant, not less. So I was looking for the red up arrows. So there's a couple of low side. There's a locus down here with some very interesting um, looking results. But just for the moment, I'm going to zoom in on this one, which we've uh, been looking at in more detail, where we're getting very strong and clear increases in yield from the wild allele, both in yield and in salinity tolerance. And here, now this is another very interesting result for those who are grumpy about GWAS, or I should say nested association structured populations. This allele was only found in one population. <laughs> And so even though we had 25 populations, the statistics was powerful enough. I should say this was done over two years, by the way, and we got exactly the same data in two years. Um, uh, so it was just from one, one family, from family one, <laughs> as it came out, which was a, a, a father line that came from northwestern Iraq. And uh, that means what we can do very easily is sort these, this subpopulation into uh, ones which are homozygous for the commercial allele, homozygous for the wild allele, and there were three heterozygotes. And what we found is a very clear increase in, this is yield in this particular plot, box and whisker plot, 20% increase in yield in control conditions and a 30% increase in yield uh, from this wild allele in saline conditions. I've got 25 minutes just coming up now. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm summarising now anyway. So... Um, what we've done is, uh, so that's just an example of how we can get data and, as I say, I can give you more details and I answer questions if you want to know what genes are in that locus and so on. There's, I'm not keeping any secrets. I just wanted to keep in time. <laughs> um, so what we're doing here is trying to develop a, a discovery and delivery uh, pipeline where we're using genetics turbocharged by modern genomics and phenomics to discover alleles that contribute to tolerance, integrate those into crops and uh, into, into plants, test them in field trials and eventually deliver them as crops. So I think it's quite interesting. We're getting actually now, I think, um, some results which are looking quite promising using forward genetic studies of naturally existing genetic diversity in crops. And I think that, yes, we've got specific traits that we think can contribute to whole plant tolerance in the field. I haven't given you any results about transpiration and transpiration use efficiency. I've just been focusing on yield. Oh, and I forgot to mention harvest index. But the harvest index is a very important effect. And the effect of salinity on harvest index we're finding is very, very important. But the aim any rate is to try to accelerate the work of plant breeders to try to integrate salinity tolerance genes that don't come with any yield penalty in non-saline conditions and in the process generate plants that help us unlock seawater. And more broadly, of course, the challenges that we're all facing in this conference in this room are very, very significant and the need for innovation is enormous. But I think I'm a, I'm a great optimist because I think we've got massive technological opportunities for addressing these challenges. Of course, we then need to disseminate these technologies through education and training, which I think uh, we all need to remember. But I do think we've got lots of chances to try to address this issue of global food security. So I'd just like to thank the people who have done the work. I still thank the uh, teams in Adelaide because their influence still pervades my research in, in Saudi Arabia. I'm um, building on all of the mistakes and experiences that I had in Adelaide. I'd like to acknowledge the Plant Accelerator people, my new team that I've built in, in, in Saudi Arabia, and, um, and in particular, the, my deputies, so Stuart Roy in Australia and Bettina Berger, who um, now runs the plant, etc. Stuart now runs the salt lab in Adelaide. Um, now my two deputies, I need two to keep me in order now, in Saudi Arabia, Sonia Negrau and Sandra Schmerkel. I'd like to thank the funding agencies. I'd like to thank you for listening as well. Thank you. Yeah, 28.